I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. Before I begin, let me uh, say congratulations for the outstanding work that you're doing on diversity here at Georgia Tech. Um, Dr. Irvin was a colleague of mine at Carolina for many years, and I'm mad at y'all for taking him, but I'll forgive you this morning. Uh, and I see the, the results of his work in your uh, university. Ladies and gentlemen, the world, our country, every region in our great nation, every state, including the great state of Georgia, is in the midst of an unprecedented demographic transformation. The kinds of changes we find ourselves in the midst of, you're going to have to buckle your seatbelt to deal with them. And if you ignore them, you ignore them at your own peril. There are lots of things you can debate today. Demography is not one of them. I assure you, if you're five years old today, five years from now, you're going to be 10 years old. Your birthday comes the same time every year. You just add one to what it was last year, and voila, you got it. In fact, when I go in for my annual review with my dean every year, I come out with a big raise, because I walk in and say, you know, when we met last year, I was 60 years old. You know what? I'm 61 this year. And next year when we meet, you know what? I'm going to be 62. It's called forecasting. I'm the best in the business. <laughs> the kinds of changes we find ourselves in the midst of, we call them disruptive demographic changes. You don't want to let mugshot there. We call them disruptive demographic changes. They're going to dramatically transform all of our social, economic, and political institutions, including the business of higher education. They're going to change the workforce. They're going to change workplaces. They're going to change consumer markets and the clients that you serve on, an annual ba on, a, on a daily basis. I want to talk in the time allotted me what the big demographic trends are uh, and where I see challenges and opportunities for those of us in higher education. And hopefully, there will be an opportunity for a discussion discussion toward the end of the presentation. <clears throat> I teach a class at Carolina in the business school on managing workplace diversity uh, and, and making the business case for it. And I focus on four things, the demographic imperative, the social imperative, the legal imperative, and the profit imperative. So what we're talking about today is the demographic imperative for what uh, we're about. I'm going to be drawing on data from the decennial census. As you know, every 10 years, we conduct the decennial census, a full enumeration of our population. How many of you all conducted your research, filled out and completed your 2010 census form? Don't lie, I got your eyes retinal scan. I'll go check. If you remember the form, it was one page, front and back, very short. Depending on the number of crumb snatches you had in your household, it took between 10 seconds and about 15 seconds to finish that thing. Radically different from earlier censuses because there's something called the census long form, which means you needed breakfast, you needed lunch, you needed dinner, and about three stiff drinks to finish that thing because they wanted to know about your firstborn, your lastborn, the one you don't own up to, everything in your business they wanted to know in that census long form. We don't do the census long form in the decennial census anymore because we have a different way of collecting data and a new survey that is, in essence, that census long form called the American Community Survey. And it is administered to a representative sample of the US population on an annual basis. So we no longer have to wait 10 years to figure out what the big trends are. Those of us who are demographic, we're in demographic heaven now. We get this stuff every year. And so, so I'm going to be relying on both the decennial census and the American Community Survey uh, to, to share with you a few things. I want to suggest to you that there are six big trends that are going to dra dramatically transform your business of higher education and everybody else in, in the U.S. I'm going to list them and then we'll talk about each one of them really quickly. The first one is the South rises again. The second one is the browning of America. The third one is marrying out is in. The fourth one is the silver tsunami is about to hit. Buckle your seatbelt. The third or fourth one, fifth one, hmm. The End of Men. I didn't make it up. It's actually the title of a book by Hannah Rosen. Uh, if you don't have time to read the book, I highly recommend it. She preceded publication of the book with two articles. She's a writer for the Atlantic Magazine. 
received, uh, published uh, two articles prior to the publication of the book. First one was by that title, The End of Men. The second one was called Boys on the Side. It'll become apparent momentarily why that. I only had one disagreement with the Hannah had a period at the end of the sentence. I refused to put a period at the end of the sentence, so we're going to leave it as a question mark and see if this is any juice with all of this. And my last one is Cooling Water from Grandma's. Well, I know that there's somebody in the room that knows that that's a song. And let me hasten the point out that I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to tell you what it's all about in terms of uh, Cooling Water from Grandma's Well and Grandpa's too. It's my last trend. Let's talk about what each one of these mean. So we are a highly mobile society, and the South has become the, demo, uh, the place for a lot of action. If you look at uh, the South continues to rise again, I'm talking about the Southern United States as defined by the Census Bureau, those states in red. If you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, long, uh, long range view and bring it forward, what you will see is for the first three quarters of the 20th century, the South only captured about 30% of net national population growth in this country because it was an economically black backwards region, uh, had all kinds of economic and racial problems and the like. So more people left the region than came. I went to high school in North Carolina. I went in 1968, which meant I was in the first wave of school integration in the South. And I remember the first football game we played my freshman year, the KKK marching outside the stadium. That was the kind of place daring us to win. You know, youthful exuberance is something. We beat them so bad, they, they, they can't even, we had to pump sunshine to them the next day. I mean, <laughs> but that was the climate in the, state at this, in the country at this time. I couldn't wait when I graduated from college in 1975 to get out of here. I bought a one-way ticket out of South, I'm out of here and I ain't ever coming back. Lots of people did that. But that, precisely at that time, something profound was going on in the South. Ladies and gentlemen, every decade since 1970, the South has captured about half of net national population growth in this country. We've gone from the place to leave to being the place to be. We've gone from the place where we speak two languages, English and bad English, to one today where we speak more than 250 different languages. We've become the cat's meow demographically in terms of everything that we talk about demographically here. If you look at the first decade of the new millennium, we added about 27 million people to our population in this country. 14.3 million of them settled here in the South. You will note that the second most rapidly growing region was the West region of the country. Very, very slow growth in the Northeast and the Midwest, profound kinds of shifts in population where we have become it demographically. Um, what is going on is a huge redistribution of population from the Northeast and the Midwest to the West and the South. What share of growth did the South capture in the first decade? That 14.3 means about 53% of growth. Second most rapidly growing region, the West, 32% of growth. Again, very, very slow growth. We actually compute something called the geographic centroid of the U.S. population the center. If you plot it over time, it has been moving progressively from the Midwest to the Southwest. Today, the geographic center is somewhere in rural Missouri. I'm predicting it's going to be in Mexico by 2020. Y'all stay tuned to see if I'm right. <clears throat> What is it all about? It's all about migration and it's all about immigration, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at the data very carefully, 2000, 2008, what you will note is the South was the only region where everybody was moving to and larger numbers were leaving. When you talk about all migrants, you talk about African Americans, you talk about the Hispanic population, the elderly population, the farm born, everybody headed South in larger numbers than they were leaving. You can't say that about the West region. The West was losing uh, elderly people. It was losing Hispanics. You can't say it about the Midwest. In fact, the only group that were moving to the Midwest in larger numbers and were leaving were the elderly during this period. And this is a news flash. After that last cold snap last year, they're going to be the heck out of there, bucket seat belt. You'll see them next week. <clears throat> And the Northeast is kind of like when the last person leaves, please turn off the lights so there's still any on there. You can actually, if you're like here in the Atlanta region, like we are in the North Carolina Triangle area, you can actually see the snowbird movement by just paying attention to license tags. Not when you're driving, but out there in the parking lot, you see all of these snowbirds doing what? headed south. And then some of them make the mistake and skip over North Carolina, Georgia, and go to Florida, figure out it's hot as hell down there, and they end up coming back to Georgia and North Carolina. They call it a halfback, so halfway back to New York, but they're having a <laughs> profound kind of change in our population. Profound kinds of redistribution of population. In fact, I was given a, 
a lecture at Cornell University a couple of months ago, and there were some elderly people in the audience, and about 40 of them wanted to come home with me, coming back. So <laughs> this is profound change that we're talking about that is driving the kind of population growth that we see uh, in terms of what's going on. But I lied to you. I said it's the South, ladies and gentlemen. It is really not the South. This redistribution trend is about four states in the South. This redistribution is really about Texas, Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. Those four states captured about 71% of that 14.3 million people. The other southern states combined about 29% of the growth. So it's highly concentrated. You're in the middle of the demographic mix uh, in terms of the profound kinds of changes that are going on here uh, in terms of what we are defining as the emergence of the South. Now, I stopped purposely at 2008 because we've had something called the Great Recession. The question becomes, what impact did the Great Recession have on migration behavior? The answer is a slowdown in the magnitude of movement, not a shift in the trajectory or direction of movement. Look over here at the upper left-hand quadrant. Net gain of about 655,000 people 2004 to 2007 during the Great Recession, 2007, 2010. That dropped down to about 397,000 people. Look at Florida. Florida actually flipped during the Great Recession. How, why was that the case? Well, a lot of people who moved to Florida with nice retirement portfolios, what happened to those retirement portfolios? They went further south. I'm going to show you shortly. They're back in the workplace called the newly unretired. It's a profound change in our workplace. And lots of people who moved to Florida and who aged to the level that need caregiving support, what did their caregivers say? We're not coming there. You have to do what? Come to where we are. Temporary kind of phenomenon, migration is always tied to the business cycle and the like, flip back. And on the international side, um, profound slowdown, largely in part, 9-11 and since. Uh, we want to build a wall around the country and keep everybody out. I want to suggest that that's not a cool thing. And it'll become apparent why that's the case in just a moment. What's happened since, to, uh, so, so 2000 to uh, 2010, here in your region, 14% uh, growth rate uh, paralleling in Georgia, the, the, the national, uh, the southern region as a whole, in the Atlanta region, about 24% growth rate in terms of population coinciding with this whole notion that we are it demographically in Georgia, North Carolina, the place. You know where your growth is occurring uh, in the region 2010 to uh, 2000 to 2010. You can look at this. We'll provide the slides for you. Um, what's happened since 2010? We've added another 10 million people to our population in this country since 2010. Same trend that characterized the first decade of New Millennium is characterizing the second decade, about 5.2 million of that 10 million people right here in the South, about 3 million of it out West, profound kinds of redistributions, very, very slow growth in the Northeast and the Midwest kind of changed. 51 percent, 52, 32 uh, for that period. <clears throat> the only difference is it's more than the four states that I mentioned earlier. I got to add Virginia to the mix. It's about North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, Florida, and Virginia because Northern Virginia is growing really, really rapidly. About 80 some percent of that, 78 percent of that growth concentrated in those states, 22 percent in the rest of the South. So the South is it demographically. Uh, here in your region, grew by 5.8 percent, while Georgia grew by 4.5 percent compared to the nation, about 3.5 percent. We continue to be the cat's meow demographically in terms of destination selection. When you look at how populations change, it's important because when you can unpack it and it gives you some clues of what's going on, a population changes as a function of inflows and outflows. Your inflows are, come from births and in migration. Your outflows come from death and out migration. When you work that equation, you come up with a typology that looks something like this. The top three categories are growing and where you really want to be. The bottom three, you don't want to be there. We've done a little map of your region, you got 16 balanced growth, meaning out in migration exceeds out migration and births exceeds death. That's the great place you really want to be. Uh, and you don't want to be either emptying out, dying, or biologically declining. Uh, you got one county that's dying, and you see most of the light view counties are balanced growth uh, uh, counties within the metropolitan area. You're in good shape demographically, but there are all kinds of diversity in that population uh, mix that uh, is going to way in terms of what you are able to do and the people you recruit and the students you recruit moving forward. <clears throat> so 
Redistribution of population undergirding that is a profound transformation in the complexion of our society, what I call the browning of America. And at the same time, there's another colorful process called the graying of America. And I want to talk about both of them because it's at the intersection that I think many of the issues that you face today are, are relevant. <clears throat> Let's talk about the browning of America first. That is really about immigration-driven population change. Quick immigration history to set the context for the browning of America. These are cartograms where we've exaggerated the size and shapes of foreign countries proportional to the number of legal immigrants we've invited to come to America. Three graphics, 21, 1921, 1960, 1961, 86, 87, and 98. Focus, if you will, on the top panel of that graphic. What you will notice is that the majority of immigrants, legal immigrants, entering our country between 1921 and 1960 came from where? Europe. Relatively few came from Asia and a smaller share from Latin America compared to Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an intentional immigration pattern because until the mid-1960s, we had an immigration law in this country that said if we were going to allow the foreign-born to come to America, it's important that they not upset the existing racial and ethnic balance of our country at the turn of the century. So we had an express preference for people who were phenotypically similar to Anglo-Saxons, people who could come to America, learn to speak English, sometimes anglicize their names in this thing called a melting pot was supposed to work. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we were operated on a quota system that was geographically discriminatory against certain people from certain regions of the world. Go back to the 1880s for an example. We had something called the Chinese Exclusion Law. It said they shouldn't be allowed to come to America because it would be, quote, unquote, difficult to assimilate into mainstream society. Fast forward to the first decade of the 20th century, we defined something called the Asiatic Barrier Region that included Japan. Shouldn't be allowed to come to America because it would be, quote, unquote, difficult to assimilate. We had all kinds of racist theories about cultural inferiority and things of that nature. So we controlled the composition of our population through our immigration policy. But that all changed in the mid-1960s. If you look at the middle panel in this graphic, what you will note is that immigration from Europe shrinks relative to the earlier period. What begins to grow? Asia, Latin America assume greater importance. How did that come about? It came about coincident with the civil rights movement in domestic life. We liberalized our immigration law in 1965 via something called the Hart Seller Act put a period in it. It's one of the most profound pieces of legislation because it's responsible for the diversity of our population as we know it today. The Hart Seller Act, in essence, eliminated those discriminatory provisions based on geographic origins, opening up the doors of our country to people heretofore had not been allowed to come in relatively large numbers. This is so profound that we use 1965 as a dividing line to distinguish two groups of immigrants in America. Anybody arriving prior to 1965, we call the old immigrants and the so-called invisible minorities. Anybody arriving since 1965, we call the new immigrants and the visible minorities. Why visible? From different regions of the world, different phenotype. Yes, the new immigrants can go through the assimilation process, but you will always know that they're different because their phenotype is different from the Anglo-Saxon model. And so takeaway number one undergirding this browning of America is fundamental shift in geographic origin. Takeaway number two is fundamental shift in phenotype. Takeaway number three, the numbers change dramatically across those time periods. Look at the left-hand side of this graphic. In between 1920 and 1961, we only allowed about 206 thousand legal immigrants to enter our country on an annual basis during the uh, early 60s to the late 19, uh, to the early 90s. We increased that number to about 561,000 annually and between 93 and about 2004 in the 800 to 880,000 range annually. And since 2005, a million to 1.1 million people entering our country through legal channels, all contributing to the growing diversity of our population in this country. In the mid-1960s, for the first time, we acknowledged that we were a nation of immigrants, and we then also opened the doors of our country in large numbers, to, or significant numbers, to refugees, or parolees, asylees, people who were being persecuted for economic, political, or religious reasons in their homelands. Those numbers fluctuated depending on conditions around the world, but they all contributed to the growing diversity of our population in this country. That's the law. Not a lot of controversy there, uh, but it's when you move here and start talking about illegal immigration when people begin to get body parts out of joint. <clears throat> now, illegal immigration wasn't much of a problem in America prior to 1965 for two reasons, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. You ever met anybody try to swim either one of those bodies and arrive to tell you that it wasn't much of a problem. 
after 1965, fundamental shift in geographic origin, a contiguous border that has been relatively fluid, this issue of illegal immigration has assumed greater importance. How important? Three to 400,000 people, the estimates range, uh, entering the country annually over the past couple of decades. You know it's a hot political potato today. It's not new. When I was on the faculty in the 80s in California, lots of discussions at that time about we got too many illegal immigrants in America. We need to do something to stem the tide. Well, in the, mid -19, in the early 1980s, the federal government says, well, maybe if we saturate labor demand, if we fill every job in our economy, there will be no reason for illegal immigrants to enter our country uh, because there won't be anything for them to do. How do we propose to do that? Via the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, we said to any unauthorized immigrant in America that if you've been here illegally, you can document that you've been here illegally since before 1982, we will grant you amnesty, no questions asked. Well, how do you document that you've been here illegally? Well, if you've got a rent receipt, a clothing bill, a greasy receipt from Burger King, say I bought a Whopper before 1982, <laughs> we grant you amnesty, no questions asked. How many people came forward to accept the federal government's offer of amnesty? About three million people came forward to accept the federal government's offer of amnesty, all contributing to the growing diversity of our population. And then understand that the numbers were actually bigger than that because they then could bring family members via the family provision of the immigration law. So the numbers were even bigger than that. But what we know is that there were about 2.9 million people here illegally who didn't come forward to accept the federal government's offer of amnesty. They said, mm-mm, I ain't going for the okie doke You ain't going to identify me and deport me. I'm just going to. They didn't go home either. So by mid-1996, we estimate there were about 5 million illegal immigrants in the country. And if you follow of the debate since 2005, number ranges anywhere wildly from 7 million to about 15 million. And I'm known as a business demographer in our, our environs at Keenan Flagler, and I easily get three to five calls a week from the media asking me how many illegal immigrants in America. And when it first started happening to me, I got real nervous. I used to stay up all night, blaze a path to the restroom, and I made it. Because no, you know, you don't want to be way off in the light. And so you worry every time I get on a plane, got a napkin. I'm figuring, trying to come up with the right number. And then I found out that this, I figured out this is crazy. So, so now I have a pat answer. When anybody calls me and asks me how many illegal immigrants in America, I say a lot. <laughs> the real number is about 11 and a half million people, OK? Now, when you hear this debate about illegal immigration, what group becomes the poster child for illegal immigration in America? Some person of Mexican descent surreptitious across the Rio Grande, right? I want to suggest to you it's a little bit more complicated than that. To get you to understand the complication, though, I got to confuse you a little bit, but it's not me doing it. It's the way the numbers are gathered. I'm sure you are aware that there are a group of immigrants in America called non-immigrants, right? Yes. yes. Got it? Yes. OK, let's talk about them. <laughs> Most people don't. Non-immigrants are people we invite to America on a temporary basis. They enter America on visas. There are about 68 different categories of these people, OK? Tourists, international students, foreign diplomats, and international baseball players. <laughs> All in America on visas. Ladies and gentlemen, if you come to America on a 90-day tourist visa and you stay 91 days, what are you? No, you're called a visa overstayer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 40 to 45 percent of the illegal immigrants in America walk through the door with papers from the federal government. When it's time to go home, what do they do? They stay. They stay. Remember the terrorists of 9-11? Six of them were here with legal papers that hadn't expired. Three of them fit the visa, visa overstayer category. When it's time to go home, they just blew us off and said, what? I'm staying. Another six, we don't know how the heck they got here. The last one came on a student visa, was supposed to go to California to learn to read and speak English, but instead went to flight school in Florida. And we now know after the fact, the flight school was a bit dubious of this guy because of his poor facility with English. So they reported him to the Immigration Service, the Federal Aviation Administration, anybody that would listen. We say, we got this guy here who he wants to be a pilot, but he can't speak and handle English very well. He could speak English well enough to tell the flight school he had no interest in learning how to land planes, only to fly them. <laughs> Why don't you hear very much about this group, folks? 
That's big business for us. Look, grew from about 11.8 million in 1981 to right before 9-11, about 32.8 million people entering our country on an annual basis on temporary visas. Tourists spend three to $5,000 per visit. International students contribute about $12.8 billion to our economy annually. Why? 10 to 15 percent higher than out-of-state tuition, and they're full freight of their cost of living because they're not allowed to work while they're here. And don't tell me that an international baseball player is a low-wage worker. It's big business for us. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not having an honest discussion about illegal immigration in this country. My guess is if you're worried about homeland security and the like, it's not the poor Mexican that has become the scapegoat that you need to be worried about. It's probably these folks. You know why? They come from all over the world. No offense, ladies and gentlemen, they look a lot like the people in this room. In fact, I don't know who's illegal in here. I'm going to find out before I leave. And they could be sitting beside you in some of the most sensitive areas of our economy and you not know it. If you get nothing out of what I say today, I have to say, let's move the debate on illegal immigration on an honest and, and correct platform. I didn't say 10%, I said 40 to 45% walk through the door with papers from the federal government. So the wall that some people want to build, first of all, who going to build that wall? And secondly, what's the purpose if I can walk through the door? So, so if you get nothing out of it, understand that we don't, we're not having an honest debate about illegal gun. My more general point is, is that you see that we kept immigration low until the mid-1960s, and you see this huge takeoff. Today we got about 40 million people. Who are they? About 47% of them are Hispanic. About 25% of them are Asian. Note that non-Hispanic whites only account for about 19% of that population. When I talk about the browning of America, I'm talking about the source of growth in our population moving ahead, and it's going to be largely, it is largely immigration driven. You can see the impact on the first decade of the new millennium. The reason I asked you, did you complete your census form uh, in 2010? is because they asked you a question. They asked you to identify. They said, are you self-identified in terms of your identity? And they say, first of all, they say, are you Hispanic or non-Hispanic? And then if you said, I'm non-Hispanic, then they said, well, what the heck are you? Are you non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaii, the Pacific Island, or are you a person of mixed race? You will note that about 50 million people said they were Hispanic, an increase of 15.2 million people. So of that 27 million people net growth in our population, 15.2 million of them were Hispanic. Note that the non-Hispanic population grew by about 12 million, a growth rate of 4.9%. But focus your attention, if you will, on the growth of the non-Hispanic white population. It grew by 1.2%. Everybody else up there, ladies and gentlemen, is a person of color. When I talk about the browning of America, I'm talking about the source of growth in our population moving ahead, 43% among Hispanics. And you see the double-digit growth in everybody except American Indians, Alaska Natives. They're all having a profound change on the complexion of our society. White share that U.S. growth, 27 million were non-white, about 92%, about 56% of it were Hispanic. Uh, here in Georgia, you added 1.5 million people to your population during that decade. 1% of them were non-white, about 29, 30% of them were Hispanic because the southern states are called new Hispanic magnets in terms of the kinds of changes, We're talking about a profound change in our population. Ladies and gentlemen, this is so important for the future of higher education and all of our institutions because what you have to understand is that migration and immigration are age selective processes. What does that mean? It means far more young people migrate and immigrate than older people. It doesn't mean older people don't move. They move slower and at a lower propensity than young people, okay? There's one more piece to that story. Don't repeat this anywhere because you can lose your job. In fact, I'm denying I say this before I say it. Young people are more likely to have children than old folk. <laughs> when you add those two things together, it has an impact on your age structure in your community. Look at it, ladies and gentlemen. So if I just took 2009. So the median age of the US population in 2009 was 37 years old. Half of us older than that, half of us younger than that. Somebody tell me what the median age of a Hispanic in America was. 27 years old. Now, how many of you have heard that Hispanics are a burden on the health care system in America? Heard that? What kind of major health problems do you have when you're median age 27? Now, before you answer that, somebody tell me what the median age of a white non-Hispanic is in America. 41. What kind of health problems do you have when you move into your 40s? 
Don't try to answer that. We'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> See, ladies and gentlemen, when you're young in your 20s, you have a cute crisis. You do that. You've usually done something dumb, like stick your finger in the lawnmower. You got to go get it glued back on. When you get in your 40s, you move from acute to what? Chronic. Which one costs the most? Chronic. Trust me, I know. I lost my wife to cancer at 48 years old. Last six months of life, her treatment, $5,000 a week. Okay? Just lost a dear friend, 62, rare form of throat cancer. His treatment is $17,000 a week. See, ladies and gentlemen, what you hear, most of this stuff makes no sense. None whatsoever. Migration, immigration, age selective processes, these are young people. And you say, well, they have a lot of babies. You need a lot of babies before you get to one cancer treatment. <laughs> makes no sense. Ladies, well, let me talk to you all. There's one other piece of this demography. You can tell your male friends to close their ears if you want, but I encourage you to tell them, listen up. There's something in demography called completed fertility, ladies. Not going to give you the big theory. You can come, I'm going to tell you that someplace else. Let me give you the pop version of it. Completed fertility is when you tell your significant other, go take out the trash. Ain't nothing else happening here. <laughs> okay? Completed fertility for women occurs between the ages of 40 and 44, okay? There's this precipitous drop in fertility between 40 and 44. What's the median age of a non-Hispanic white female in America? 42.6. Now, my third grade teacher told me that after 0 0.5, roll up, 43. Okay? Now, what you will notice is below non-Hispanic white females, everybody below that is a non-white female. And you will notice further a 10 to 20 year gap in the median age. Do you know what that gap is? That's your fertility gap. Ladies and gentlemen, we know exactly how the population is going to change in the future and where the sources of growth are going to come from. Now, I know that some of y'all in your 40s in here tomorrow, mm -mm, I'm going home and fix this tonight. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I dare you. We're talking about a heck of an adjustment in our population, ladies and gentlemen. And we already see it in the data on children. In 1990, 66% of all births in America were to non-Hispanic white families. In 2008, that had dropped to about 50% of all births. And in 2011, it dropped below 50% for the first time in history. And it's unlikely to go the other way. Why? Because we are an aging population, and you're aging out of the childbearing years. I told you, ladies and gentlemen, this is biology. It's not sociology. It's one of the most predictable things in the world. We know what the next generation of kids are going to look like, given that. <clears throat> so here in Atlanta, you are a microcosm. Added about a million people to your population. 102% growth in the uh, Hispanic population. Your white population grew by 3.7%. I mean, it's the whole thing of nationally you, you represent here in the metropolitan region in terms of the kind of browning that we're talking about, continued browning. Your age structure is not unlike the nation as a whole. 41 for white uh, females here, about 26 for Hispanics. But to give you some sense of the fertility gap, what you will note is all females, 58 live births per 1,000 women, but you get down there with Hispanic females, it's 91 live births per 1,000 women. So you might be lucky and go home and squeeze out one, but you're not going to make up the difference between 58 <laughs> and 90 something. So I mean, try all you want to, it's just not going to happen. And so that, that's, that's the fundamental kind of change. We're talking about a heck of a color adjustment in our population. Uh, in 2005, 67% of our population was non-Hispanic white. Five, 10 years earlier, it was 74%. We now think the non-Hispanic white share would drop below 50% at around 47% by 2050 growth among these non-white groups that we're talking about, lots of immigration-driven stuff. At the same time that that browning is going on, we are experiencing what we call a graying of America, what I call the silver tsunami. And what is that all about? Browning is about immigrants, people of color, transforming the complexion of society. Graying is about the aging of our native-born population. And three things are driving that. 
changes in longevity, declining fertility rates, and the aging of the boomer cohort. We're living longer. The average person turning 65 today is going to live another 18.7 years, and we think living to 100 on a routine basis is well within reach. And there's one school of thought that says a person who will live to 130 has already been born. Several things are driving that. We're living longer, eating better, being more active. We've got all kinds of health advances that are extending our lives. And now we got this thing called regenerative medicine. We have a scientist at in North Carolina has regenerated a bladder. So Mr. Provost, your bladder wear out. We'll say you no, and you just tell me what color you want. We're working on every body part that's going to extend life uh, here. And, and, and have you all, I mean, we've, we've actually, we got popular marketing for this. Have you all heard this thing about 60 is the new 30? Yeah, you know, they got these uh, commercials on TV now with women 60 years old wearing yellow spandex twitching, talking about 60 is the new 30. I turned 60 last year. 60 is 60. <laughs> that, that foolishness. But, but we are living longer, OK? And we're projecting now that there will be over 600,000 centigenarians in the US, uh, and some, the, the number ranges between 600,000 and about a million in the US, and about 3.5 million globally over 100 years old. We got these uh, five longevity hotspots around the world and the like. So this aging thing is, is relevant. And fertility rates have changed dramatically. If you look at those women 40 to 44 and look back at their fertility, in 1976, the, uh, the average woman, uh, only about 10% of women 40 to 44 were childless. That had doubled to 20% by uh, 2006. The average woman 40 to 44 had 3.1 kids in 1976. That's above replacement level. It had dropped to below replacement level by 2006. 59% of all women uh, 40 to 44 had three or more kids uh, in 76. It dropped to 28%. Why? This room is a powerful statement. More women in the workplace, educated, career-oriented. When you become more active, educationally career-oriented, what happens to the age at marriage? goes up. What happens to the age at first childbirth? goes up. You're reducing the number of years that it's safe to have children. And some of you say, forget it. I ain't doing it anyway. So it's, uh, it has a profound impact on fertility. And it depresses uh, fertility. And you see the down uh, set there. So there's something called the total fertility rate, which says, as a couple, you need to have 2.1 kids to replace yourself. OK? Don't ask me about the point one. You just got to be rocking and rolling. OK? <laughs> It's 2.1 because some babies die at birth, OK? If you have to have 2.1 kids to replace yourself, who's replacing themselves in America today? You got one group. You got one group. So if you want to build a wall around the country and send everybody home, what do you got left? A bunch of old footy duddies <laughs> who can't do much. That's what you got. Fundamental demography. And then there's a group of us who were born between 1946 and 1964. Let me see a show of hands, 1946 to 1964. Those of us with our hands up are part of the post-World War II hormonal rush in America. Our fathers went off to World War II and came back home and got busy. <laughs> got busy to the tune of producing 80 million of us. We're known as the boomer generation. On January 1st of 2011, the first baby boomer born in America turned 65 and became eligible for what? Mm -mm, everything. <laughs> Every day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year for the next 20 years, we boomers will be turning 65 to the tune of 8,000 per day. Every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for the next 20 years. What you will notice is boomers grew by 32%. You'll note the second most rapidly growing population was the 65 plus population. Why? Because we're living longer, another 18.7 years. Now, this is why the Social Security debate is so important, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the 25 to 44 year old population. What happened to it? It actually declined. Now, 
when people tell you that Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system, do you know what that means? Somebody else spending your money, okay? So when you age into Social Security eligibility, you need somebody behind you to be doing what? Working and paying in, but that population is doing what? Declining. Why? Well, some of this baby bust. We stop having children sufficient numbers to replace ourselves. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, some of the debilitating diseases that beset us boomers and pre-boomers later in life are now besetting Gen X and Gen Y earlier in life, leading to the early onset of death and disability. And they're mostly lifestyle factors, obesity, diabetes, and things of that nature. So you can't pay your bills when you get in that kind of situation. That's why you can't afford to be anti-immigrant, because you need to do what? Fuel that population that's going to contribute to the future viability of our population. It's, my, it's, it's a major kind of thing. That's how often we're aging. I told you 8,000 per day. And if you look at Atlanta, ladies and gentlemen, the good thing about you is you are a population of immigrants and the like, because if you compare it with the nation as a whole, you'll see that your growth in the young population is much greater than the nation as a whole. And that's all driven by these young people coming in. That's going to be the next generation of talent that comes into the university if you do the right things, and that has to propel the community in a highly, global econ in a highly volatile global economy um, uh, moving forward. <clears throat> This has profound implications for your diversity initiative here because this aging thing is no joke. For, first of all, for the first time in history, we have four generations in the workplace today. Everybody from the pre-boomer, born in 1945 and early, who's most familiar and love with a rotary dial phone, <laughs> to the millennial that waltzes in the work at 10 o'clock in the morning with two buds in the ear whistling, and all you boomers who arrive at 5 o'clock in the morning because that's the way we roll, and the boomer looks at the millennial and says, look at that, that's a bad work ethic. Come rolling up in here at 10 o'clock in the morning. And the millennial takes the two buds out long enough to look at the boomer and say, you can't spell work ethic because I finished walking in the door what you've been navel gazing at since 5 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and Mr. Pre-Boomer's trying to get the first rotor dial call out for the day. <laughs> Somebody's got to manage all of that. And we need all of them in the workplace because consumer markets look what? Just like that. Just like that. We're not ready, because we have an HR system that is a what? One size fits all. So this is the multi-generational thing that we have to figure out and how to fig figure it out. That's the population across those multi-generations that are still in the workplace and the like. You can look at this on your own. We'll post it on the website. The other thing is, with this aging thing, it's no joke, ladies and gentlemen. This is, the, this is big organizational stuff. Succession planning. Is a big thing. How many of your faculty and staff are aging baby boomers? What percentage? Well, they asked me to answer that question for the UNC system and for my University of Carolina. And I found that 66% of the faculty at Carolina was aging baby boomers. How do you think about replacing 66% of your workforce? Now, some of us should have been gone a long time ago. That's not the issue. <laughs> and for the UNC system, it was 77% of the faculty. And mind you, the next generation can't look like what? The past generation. So succession planning is big. And there's two pieces to it. The warm bodies piece, how do you think about the next generation of talent to recruit and to retain? And secondly, a lot of us old heads Got a little knowledge and the like. Well, what's going to happen to that knowledge when we leave? Well, if we haven't forgotten it all, it's going to do what? Go with us. The real challenge is for organizations, higher education units, and other organizations, is to make sure that there's knowledge succession from what? That generation to the next generation of talent. And, and, and so this is the big succession planning issue. The last issue with this aging thing. Child care won't be the big issue for most of our organizations in the future. It will be elder care. And elder care is radically different from child care. Child care is actually pretty predictable. You drop your crumb snatch off at the daycare in the morning. <laughs> you go pick them up at 5 o'clock. Now, you may have to go at lunchtime if they do something they got no business. But normally, it's pretty what? 
Elder care, particularly if you have a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia, is a 24-7 round-the-clock initiative. You hear a lot about work-life balance, HR style now. We've thrown that concept out. If you have a if you have elder care responsibilities and a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia, you will have to figure out how to squeeze work in. So now we talk about work-life integration. And that is one of the biggest challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a $40 billion a year problem in terms of lost work productivity. And people don't talk about it for fear of what? Reprisal. So until uh, last year, at, uh, I had. Uh, eight family members, I have three siblings, and I said we had eight family members between the ages of 84 and 97 that we were responsible for taking care of. Some days I was afraid to pick up the phone. And even when you pick up the phone, your loved ones lie through their teeth. <laughs> because they're proud people, they won't tell you the truth about anything, you literally have to go. So it's 10.30 at night in February, 30 degrees outside, my 87-year-old uncle calls, he's wheelchair bound, visually challenged, lives by himself, a hundred, an hour and a half from me. He calls me and he says, my heat's not working and it's cold in here. He says, I must be out of oil. I said, Unc, you are not out of oil. I pay the oil bill. That oil company is so afraid they just dug holes around your house and put oil in. I know you're not out of oil. He said, well, maybe the system is not. Well, I said, I just had it serviced right before Christmas. I doubt that's good. He said, well, it's cold in here and it's not working. Now, but you have to understand, wheelchair bound, visually child, older house, and your thermostat in these older houses assume that you're standing upright and you see it eye to eye, and it's one of these old digital things, but he's wheelchair bound, visually child, got one of those little clickers. Okay? What has he done? He's turned the thermostat off and can't see. It's 10.30 at night. I got an 8 o'clock class tomorrow morning. I got to drive an hour and a half to do what? Turn the thermostat on. You say, well, why don't you call somebody? Because everybody in the neighborhood just like him. <laughs> okay? And the second piece of that is, he's sitting there in his wheelchair with his double barrel shotgun in his lap like Dirty Harry saying, come on up in here. I can't see you, but I'm going to shoot you. That's elder care, ladies and gentlemen, and those are the responsibilities that all of us have, but our HR systems are not even, it's not even on the radar screen. And when you're losing $40 billion a year in lost work productivity, that's something pretty challenging. We have an HR system that's one child. This is a global phenomenon, this aging thing. Japan sold more adult diapers last year than they did baby diapers. Vancouver, Canada just outlawed the use of doorknobs in all new construction. See, you're all on the leading edge because you're doing this big human redesign thing for ADA, but I want to I suggest something to you that this elder care thing, this senior thing goes beyond ADA, okay? Why would it, anybody outlaw doorknobs in new construction? Might as well be a nine millimeter gun held to your head if you're arthritic and fire breaks out in your house. China. 4 to one problem, because of one-child policy, every young adult has two parents and four grandparents to look after. You know? And we passed a critical benchmark in America uh, in 2011 where more deaths than births among non-Hispanic whites. We're talking about a profound change. We're talking about disruptive demographics that are going to change. And ladies and gentlemen, when you go out of here, I guarantee you when you go to the street out there, there'll be a pedestrian crossing signal and a timer. That timer assumes that the average person walks four feet per second. The average senior walks two to three feet per second. Everything has to change as a function of an aging population. And I hate to tell you all, this room is not senior friendly. Why? It's not senior friendly. You're one slip and fall from a major lawsuit. Don't feel bad. Every organization is that way. Every organ. Everything has to change as a function of the aging population. What do y'all have graduation? What do y'all have? Huh? Facility. What facility? Ba basketball. Who comes to graduation? Grandma. I shouldn't be telling y'all this. 
Family life is changing. What, what do I got? Huh? Am I done? 25 minutes. Family life is changing. I didn't think I had that long. That's what I mean. 25 minutes. So at the same time, marrying out is in. Profound change in family life. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, it was illegal for even blacks and whites to marry until the mid-1960s. That all changed. But this is not about just blacks and whites marrying. This is about a more profound shift in marriage patterns in America. The outmarriage rate among newly married couples means you marry somebody that's different from your own ethnic racial background. Double between 1980 and 2009 from 7% of all marriages to about 15%. And it went from about 3% to about 8% among currently married people. Marrying somebody different. Well, who is doing all this hooking up in strange ways? <laughs> about 41% of those marriages are between Hispanics and whites. About 15% of them are between Asians and whites. And in about 16% of the cases, both parties are non-white, blacks and Asians, Asians and Hispanics, and the like. And then there's this group of other, I don't know who the heck they are, but they're hooking up. <laughs> you will note that the smallest share is black-white marriages. But what is this all about, ladies and gentlemen? The second most rapidly growing population behind the Hispanics were people who self-identified as what? Two or more races. See, you got to be careful how you portray family life and identity in this marketplace. Because the, the kinds of class classifications that we are accustomed to using and putting people in, a lot of them don't fit those classifications, and they won't allow you to do what? Put them in those classifications. So, and this, become, this is big in, in marketing. Now, how many of y'all remember familiar with the Cheerios commercial? I remember that Cheerios couch. They, they released a Super Bowl a couple years ago. Black guy laying on the couch. Little girl runs up and dumps Cheerios. On this, obviously, little girl is mixed. And then it shifts, the camera shifts to the wife, and she's white. You, you follow the email traffic on that? Yeah. Wasn't pretty. Wasn't pretty. But I like Cheerios. I eat them every, every day because they're heart healthy, you know. And, 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 and I like the, uh, uh, the company because they weren't, they didn't even think twice about the criticism, so the Super Bowl the next year, they released the next video. And the woman pregnant again. <laughs> Definitely don't follow that. But what is this all about? It's about you have to be careful how you portray family life because it is changing so dramatically. And it raises all kinds of questions about whose history do we teach in our curriculum and offerings and all of that. There's a history there. There's all that kind of stuff. We, we got to change and transform. That's the out marriage pattern for the US 20, to 2010 and 2010 to 2013. You can look at this on your own. At the same time that family life is changing and living arrangements are becoming far more diverse and interesting. Cooling water from grandma's well and grandpa's too is about grandparents raising grandchildren. Okay? If you look at households with children, grew by 3.8%. Households with just husband and wife and their kids, no grandparents present, 1.4%. Households where both grandparents are present, raising grandchildren, grew by 42%. Grandmama only raised 9.3%. Grandfather only raising kids, 29% increase. Now, most of you are probably thinking about your grandma and mine. If your grandma was like mine, my grandma was 97 when she passed away. That means she almost had an AARP card when I was born. What you need to understand here is about half of these grandparents are between the ages of 30 and 50. Okay? What does that mean? Don't look all cross-eyed when your 30-year-old assistant walks up to you and says, I need time off today to go to school to check on my what? Grandchild. It'll be real. It'll be real. We've built our own school for vulnerable children in North Carolina and Durham. I have a 45-year-old great-grandmother as a caregiver. Now, there are some grandparents like yours and mine. Grandma, 87 years old, can't get out of the rocking chair, and the 14-year-old granddaughter got the car out cruising looking for a 31-year-old man. I didn't make that one up. That one happened in my own family. Okay? Here I go again, 10.30 at night. <laughs> 
See, I like pinstripes, as y'all can tell, but I'm lucky that they're going this direction today. <laughs> Cause, yeah, yeah, cause I don't know about Georgia, but in North Carolina, we don't allow 14 year olds to drive. And, and I don't care what state it is, we don't allow them to be looking for what? 31 year old. Grandma, now I'm not talking about some ed educated grandma. My mother-in-law went to college at 15 years old. 40 year career in, uh, as a French teacher and a guidance counselor, distinguished, but can't get out of rocking chair. Gotta go exactly a little street justice. And for you all, what you have to understand is we got kids in our school who can't qualify, smart as a whip, but can't qualify for a college scholarship because scholarship is based on household income. Yep. See, your household income can look pretty good when there are 40 people in the house. <laughs> but not a single one of them make enough money to buy you a what? Book. If you don't understand that family life is changing, don't tell me that kid doesn't deserve a scholarship and all of that, but it's circumstance because we've underestimated the impact of the Great Recession on household structure, family life, and all of that. Huge kind of thing, this is a big one. And not only, and the reason that's important, not only are the kids in the household, one or more of the biological parents may be there too. See, when the Great Recession, you lose your house to foreclosure and like, where do you go? Home, you're home. Oh, profound change in family, and we need to factor that in. Also, shifts in household structure. Census enables us now to follow uh, you know, same-sex households and the like uh, with children, and you see this is from uh, the, the 2009 data, uh, uh, about 104, 105,000 same-sex households uh, with children. Uh, most of them were unmarried females with children, but there were some unmarried males with children uh, in the household, usually their own child and the child of their significant other, but raises all kinds of questions. You never know what background the kid who walks in your door, where they come from and all of that is changing dramatically. So various kinds of diversity that undergirds the demographic strip, but here's the three things that you got to worry about. The end of men, the triple whammy geographic disadvantage, and I think education necessary but may not be sufficient in the new economy. <clears throat> In the men, let's deal with that first. Good news is women are about to surpass men as the numerical majority in paid workforce in America. About 49.8% of all paid workers were women in 2010. That's the good news. But ladies, this is not because we've decided to treat you all fairly, okay? There's still a huge gender wage gap out there. What is it, 82, 83 cent on the dollar, or something like that. Uh, rather, this reality is because men are doing so poorly in American society today. Oh, man. Look at the Great Recession. 80% of the job loss among men. Some people call it a man session. But it goes deeper than that. Today, three times as many men of working age do not work at all compared to 1969. Why don't they work? Skills mismatches, haven't been able to make the adjustment to the new economy. Disabilities, or they're incarcerated. Uh, disability rate doubled between 1970 and 2009. Median wage dropped by about $13,000 after accounting for inflation. But most telling, and Georgia Tech is an anomaly here, I realize this, but nationally, after peaking in 1977, male college completion rates have barely changed over the past 35 years. The sex ratio in higher education has been 60% female, 40% male for a decade. In 2010, we granted 572,000 more degrees to men, uh, to women than we did men in higher education. Where are the men? Where are the boys? So ladies, the good news is, y'all looking good, educated, <laughs> making a little money. But if you ain't hitched, forget about it. Ain't enough eligible, marriageable males to go around. And I know this because I gave a lecture here about six months ago and a lady chastised me. She said, you drove all the way down here to tell me that I've been living it for 20 years. <laughs> and you shoot the message for the message. <clears throat> Where are the men? Look at it. Male enrollment, two-year colleges, Southeast, I don't have data on for you all, about 40% male there. UNC system, 
44% male for the, the 16 campus system. The white schools about 46%. The minority serving the black schools and the one that serves Native Americans, 38%, and the HBU's 37% male. We had one a couple of years ago that was 80-20. 80% 80 female, 20% male. Now, I don't know why it wasn't that way when I was there. <laughs> But listen, how do you have stable communities, stable families and the like with that kind of sex ratio? Where are the men? Where are the boys? It starts early, as you know, and the like. Here's the thing that I worry about when it comes to diversity and the future of America. And it exists at the intersection of the browning and the graying of America. It's what I call the triple whammy of geographic disadvantage. Let me do it for you. First, the racial typology of US counties. Those counties right there are racial generation gap counties. In those counties, the adult voting age population are predominantly white, aging, empty nesters. But the school age population is predominantly non-white. What kind of support for public education do you think you get there? That's the ain't got no dog in the K-12 education fight. I'm most concerned about retirement amenities, crime, and safety. Okay. Those are majority minority counties. The adult voting age population is predominantly non-white. School age population predominantly non-white. Lots of interest in public education. What's missing? They're mostly low wealth counties, not enough money to do anything. The gray are majority, majority counties. The adult voting age population predominantly white, school age population predominantly white. But in those counties, about a fifth of the kids who go to public schools are kids of color. But if you peer beneath the veneer, the kids of color are either attending racially isolated schools within those districts or within the good schools, they're underrepresented in the what? Gifted and talented, honors, AP, and the like. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, inherent in our diversity, browning and graying, non-white kids are between a rock and a hard place through no fault of their own. Okay? The next generation that has to propel us. That's whammy number one. Whammy number two, this is at the neighborhood level, and this is segregation. Those neighborhoods right there are 60% or more white. Okay? Those are 60% or more non-white. And those are going from white to non-white, the yellow. That's hyper-segregation. That's separate and unequal, and just about as bad as before Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Whammy number two. This is whammy number three, poverty. Those neighborhoods, poverty rate for children is 40% or higher, okay? Extreme poverty. Those, the poverty rate is between 25 and 39 percent. We call those two combined concentrated poverty, okay? And the yellow, uh, poverty rate is less than 25 percent. We call those areas of concentrated affluence, okay? That's when I talk about the triple whammy of geographic disadvantage, that the average non-white kid got some combination of all those things that they're fighting today. Now, mind you, this is the next generation of talent that has to do what? Propel our nation. They're between a rock and a hard place. 9.8 million of them, 93% non-white, victimized by the triple whammy. 12 million, 81% non-white, got two out of the three things. And then about 20 million got one of them. And you see 32 million kids, things, life's pretty good. That's food deserts. No car and no supermarket within. Yeah. I was blown away at our school in Durham the other day because I stopped over at the end of the day, pickup time, and started talking to three little girls. And I made the mistake of asking them, so what did you have for dinner last night? And one of the little girls looked at me and she said, last night was not my turn to eat. She said, in our household, we rotate who gets to eat dinner, and I get to eat maybe every third night. 
Now, I'm not talking about some rule pork kind I'm talking about. If you look at ratings of the Triangle area in Durham, we're all at the bag of chips and dip, and then got kids with no chips or dip. I don't care what quality education you have, if kids are hungry and the like, no new learning goes on, okay? And it gets worse. Those are expansion and expulsion rates. Three million kids expended, suspended and expelled every year. A quarter of a million of them referred to the police for misdemeanor charges as early as the third grade. For altercations back in my day, you got a thumping on the head when you got home, and maybe a two by four upside head, but you were back in school the next day, and you didn't do that again. In fact, I got one whooping in my childhood. It was June 4th, 1956, <laughs> at 2.30 in the afternoon. Okay. Don't do nothing else. That's black kids. Those are Latino kids. And so how are you going to learn? And most suspensions on average, 10 days. How are you going to learn? And what's interesting, if you look at when they take in the course test, look at the sex ratio and balance and who's taking the test. Boys ain't even in the room. Two things are happening. Where are they? Suspended or expelled. Or there's one school of thought that says there's some school administrators out there that are savvy enough to say, tell the boys, don't come to school the day of the test, because I can't have you messing up my what? Scores. Scores. <clears throat> and that's just, I mean, it, it just kills you. This is a study that we just finished for a community college. 1,500 kids go from the uh, uh, high school of uh, 6,000 graduates. They go to this community college. 71% of them can't pass developmental level math one. That's the number that need two or more remedial courses, the red and the green. Uh, only 7% of the 71% ever get to the starting line of college level math. And this is the next generation, folks. I'm gonna just, this is a triple whammy for you all. I'm just run through it. You got the numbers there. I gave you the numbers, that's your triple whammy. Here. Even if you get that right, ladies and gentlemen, Everybody talking about millennials and going to do this and do that? That's the number of bachelor's degree holders under age 25 who were, under other, were either jobless or underemployed. 2,041% of them. 2011, 54% of them jobless or unemployed. We call them boomerang crumb snatchers. Why? You sent them off to college, graduated with a ton of what? Debt, and back home forever. <laughs> not buying cars, not buying houses, not marrying and all of that stuff. And the poverty rate increased more rapidly among people with some college, a bachelor's degree or higher than it did among people with a high school diploma or less during the Great Recession. We've not seen anything like this before. That's your pipeline. You need something else in your competitive toolkit. I don't have the time to talk about all the things you need, but that's what you need in your toolkit. What do we got to do? We got to figure out how to manage this transition from the browning to the graying of America in our, our education institution and every other institution. I don't see, ladies and gentlemen, how we're going to compete, thrive, and prosper without embracing immigrants. We are an aging population, declining fertility. You need to renew the gene pool. That's one way to do it. We got to address our wayward sons problem because it has implications for communities and families and the like. I think we all got to become more actively engaged in K-12 education because that's the pipeline. If we leave those kids uneducated, we got no clients to serve in the future. And if you just go, just try to get the best and the brightest, you're leaving a large population behind. We need to do something there. You all do this. I know you establish these ties with businesses and the like to understand the skills and the like. And I think we all got to adapt the iceberg model of diversity. Y'all familiar with this model? Iceberg model, if you think about an iceberg, you only see half of it, what's above ground. And most diversity usually focuses on what's above ground, the visible characteristics of diversity. But I would encourage you to think about all of those invisible diversity traits there. 
because those are the kinds of things that are going to make you world class. Because not everything that challenges people in their lives are visible or they even talk about on a daily basis. So you have to build a far more agile and flexible kind of environment. I'll stop right there. So we have a couple of minutes here, and I'd uh, ask Dr. Johnson if he'd be willing to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and so a couple, so not everybody at once, just a couple. Yes, okay. ma'am. Y'all in a heap of trouble. Um, I, I, think, um, I think you're part of the generation that is really responsible for elder care responsibilities, increasingly, of both maybe parents and what? Grandparents, number one. Uh, and you're part of the sandwich generation because you probably got kids behind you who may or may not be doing very well and they're knocking on your door as well. So boomers and Gen X got that kind of challenge. And that impacts your performance in what? The work environment and the light, or forces you to have multiple jobs or whatever, trying to keep all those things, trying to balance all of those things. Uh, and then there may be some requirements, and this is not just limited to it, but all of us, it's going to be lifelong learning. We're going to have to constantly reinvent ourselves to be employable in this economy. So it's, it, there are quite a few challenges there. And that's what that toolkit is all about that I didn't, didn't talk about a lot. But those are the kinds of things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, say that again. I'm sorry. I, don't, I use them as synonymous. I don't, I don't draw a distinction. I personally think that that's a diversion from what the real issues are. And so there are people who are unauthorized to be in the country uh, through the legal challenge, challenge, channels. But I don't, I don't get into that debate of whether you call them one thing or the other. <clears throat> that's just a personal choice. Yes, ma'am. Who's our? Older than you. Oh, be careful. <laughs> what, what's happening to? What's happening is I have an elderly mother. I have an elderly sister that is taking care of our mother. The elderly brother that's older than the sister is joining in, but I'm here in the south, and so I only go up maybe two or three times a year. We have difficulty sometimes even trying to get extended time off to go because right. Right. But then the job is saying, oh, three weeks. You Can't know? do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so what, what happens in those cases? Because we were raised, we don't put our right. people in right. nursing homes. That's exactly right. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's a discussion that we have to have on the organizational side about, you know, the challenges. And more and more, you won't be the, the unique case. It's going to be more and more people who are in those situations. But the other thing that's a wonderful opportunity at a place like Georgia Tech, one of the interesting things now is that there are lots of technologies coming on the market to help with caregiving. How many of y'all know that AT&T is in the shoe, the phone company is in the shoe business now? AT&T has a smart slipper and a smart shoe that enables you to monitor the behavior of your loved one on your cell phone. So if grandma didn't get up this morning and go in the kitchen to get her coffee at the normal time, you know it. And so there have been these kinds of technologies that help people age in place and live independently longer. And so there are lots of things like that coming on the market. And, uh, but it's a, there's no question, it's a huge, huge challenge. And some of us, unlike your family, got nieces, nephews, and siblings who are, ain't worth a nickel. They won't do anything. <laughs> And so you have to do even more. I got a couple I want to sell to you all. <laughs> one question, one last yes, question. Hi. Hey, my dear. How are you? Same here. So um, let's take everything that you've talked about 
And let's look at this global world and global competitiveness and the, and the great advantage we've had in emerging markets and their demand on, on a world's resources. And how do, we, how do we take where we are and use that in a way that allows us to continue to be competitive and yeah. certainly to enjoy, yeah, if we yeah. get lucky, the position we've had. Historically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, first of all, we've got to frame it that way. So, so we got to frame these issues as competitiveness issues, but all of the things that I talked about as challenges are opportunities for business development and employment growth. And, and so when you look at you know, this, uh, this global aging thing, I mean, there's so many opportunities there, both in this country and for joint ventures. Uh, 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 there will be 330 million people in China, 65 or older by 2040. That's bigger than the entire US population. So all kinds of possibilities there for business ventures, new ideas. I think we ought to turn these things into, um, I teach, a, um, I have a, a global uh, elder care innovations hub at Carolina. We draw from all of the med schools, nursing, audiology, uh, we with the age lab at MIT. We're focusing on innovations in this space to create jobs, to create businesses, and the like worldwide. And so I think we got to look at some of these things, uh, these social things, as opportunities and market, and market them in, in the marketplace. Very good question. I mean, that's, that's exactly where we have to head, I think. Mm -hmm. So let's give Dr. Johnson a Georgia Tech welcome. Thank you. Thank you.